But Father, we just thank you for this evening. We thank you for this opportunity to worship you and to praise you, to give you glory, and to just see how beautiful your word is and how we can walk out and see uh, your uh, blessing in our lives. And so we just thank you for all that you do. We give you um, just applause and we give you thankfulness uh, for what you've done in our lives. And we look forward to what you have in store for us. Um, because we know that as long as we give, we draw breath, you've given us life to fulfill your will and to walk according to your ways. And we give you glory and praise by Shem Yeshua. Amen. Amen. All right. Okay. So we're talking about spiritual gifts for the next uh, few times and uh, next several lessons. And we're going to take a gift assessment at the very end. If it's just us four, we may do it uh, uh, together just to help you guys with it. Email it to you or I can show you a format on how to do it. You can take it and then add it up and we can do it. But it takes a little bit of time to do it. So I don't want to use the whole time on this to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah, this, this is all about anyhow. It's about teaching. It's about uh, becoming strong and, and all that kind of stuff and learning who we are in Messiah. So we're going to talk about spiritual gifts tonight. Um, and we may get some calls on maybe people aren't able to log in tonight. So um, we'll see what goes on there. But um, anyhow... Let me see just real quick if I'm if I'm missing out on some text. No, nope, not yet. Um, okay, so all right. So everybody open up to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 in your Bible. I opened right through to it. <laughs> wow. The good thing, because right, remember I talked about you opened it up and it was false. <laughs> I know. You just hung yourself. You don't want to do that. Okay. <laughs> So, oh, we got more people coming in. Yay! I'm so excited. Is this Kim, my friend from, uh, uh, oh, is this my friend, Kim? We'll see if it's from uh, uh, New Hope, New Hope, New Hope Church. Uh, maybe. We'll see. Hi, Kim. Welcome to tonight's study. Is this Kim Palm? Uh, your your mic is muted. Love for you to take it off if you can. Say hello to everybody. Hi. Hi. Who's this, Kim? It's Kim. Kim is Angela, actually. Oh, Angela. Yay. Good to have you on. <laughs> What's your nationality, okay. again, Angela? My nationality is Chinese, Indonesian Chinese. Indonesian Chinese. Ni hao. Mm. Welcome. Hao. <laughs> Yeah, That's awesome. the only word that I can understand. <laughs> I don't speak Chinese. Yeah. That's like Sorry me. for yeah. You That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Well, welcome. Um, all right. So we're talking about spiritual gifts tonight. The people will probably still join us as we go on. But open up to Romans chapter 12. And I want to start at the very beginning and take time to read it. Let me read it first and then we'll list down. We have kind of one here like a list of 16 gifts. But you'll see the uh, the other gifts that you'll see is like in Ephesians where it says that God gave to some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. There's definitely a calling of these particular gifts in someone's life. And even though you may have a pastoral gift or a teaching gift, that doesn't mean you've been called to the office of a teacher. That doesn't mean you've been called to the office of a prophet if you prophesy. And these are important distinctions that we need to, to, to establish. But before we do that, let's let's look at chapter 12 here first. And we'll talk about those later on as we progress for the next few weeks in these uh, in the spiritual gifts, okay? But in uh, Romans chapter 12, it says, I urge you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God. This is really important. By the mercies of God. Our giftings and our abilities that we have in God are all because of him. And they're all based on his desire to give us the gifts. And, his de and whatever he determines according to the faith that we have, he proportions those gifts according to the faith that we have. So, and according to his grace and his, he looks at us and he determines, he, he forms Sandra and he forms Marguerite, he forms mm -hmm. Ken, me and Linda, and in that process of forming, and he's breathing life to it, he's saying this individual is going to choose this area of his life. Because we've got to think about it. If he gives us free will, when does he give us free will? It has to happen when he's creating us. And so when he's creating us, 
he has to know that there's a particular bent in our life that we're going to choose and we're going to go down. And we want to walk according to his way, especially when we become believers. But we're going to have certain abilities and capabilities and understanding of God that God's going to bestow upon us according to his mercies, the gifts that he wants us to walk in. And this is beautiful. Now, that does not mean that we cannot walk in any gift because I believe we can. That's the beautiful thing. If you are an open vessel before the Lord, let me ask you something. If I took, if I took this cup, can this cup uh, be used also as a bowl? Sure. Can it be used as a glass? Even though it's a cup. You can put water in it, coffee in it, tea in it. You can put cereal in it. You can put ice cream in it. Okay. So you can put all kinds of stuff in this. And, and this is still, it's still a cup, but it's, it's just a vessel if you think about it. This can also hold a flower. You can add dirt to it, put a little flower in it, and have it up. And if it was a pretty cup and did all kinds of stuff, and we placed it, we can display it. It can be used as a, uh, you know, as an instrument. Hmm. Right? It can be used mm -hmm. as an instrument, especially if it's part of, a, part of a group. So we have all these things that we can do um that we can take this vessel and say man this can really be used as a lot of things you put a little cap over it right and it could be used as a drum right remember the coffee can remember the coffee can the coffee can was awesome oh, yeah. and now that, that kept my kids busy for hours <laughs> you give them a couple of sticks and they're just boom 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 you take two of them and what was interesting is if you fill them up with dirt on the inside and you take the the lid on at different levels they made different sounds mm -hmm. Because there, were, there was a certain amount of air and percussion in each and every one of them. So, yeah. so this cup, even though it's a cup, and we use it for most, most of the time, many of us use it for tea or coffee, it can be used as many different vessels. And so when we open up our lives to God and say, Lord, here I am, I'm an empty vessel, he can pour out whatever gift he desires and, and chooses to do so in your life. And that, that's important for you to understand because it's God's mercies and his grace working for you. And so when, when you go to somebody, and they're in the hospital and they need a gift of healing to operate through your hands and through your prayers. He's not going to give you a, a, a message in tongues to give that person. Unless that person has the gift of interpretation and you say something in tongues that is prophetic and that, and that word comes out, that you might give them a word. Hey, you know, you say, and they go, I'm going to die tonight. I'm going to Jesus tonight. <laughs> and that's the interpretation. we got to be careful about that because that's 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 kind of what happens a lot we think that we can't pray for somebody because that's not my gift or i can't evangelize to somebody because that's not my gift if we're an open vessel before the lord and we're empty he can fill us up and so we have to understand that it's by his mercy so uh rebecca you just joined us a bit ago if you go to romans chapter 12 is where we're at so we're talking here about the mercies of god the very first verse so I'll just re redo it here again. I urge you, therefore, brothers and sisters, and I love this. I love this. This is not B'nai Israel. This is not the sons of Israel. This is not to the daughters of Israel. This is to the B'nai Israel. This is to the sons, to the children, or the sons, brothers and sisters. So this means women can walk in these gifts. Okay, I struggle when I, I see a denomination or I see... A particular person that's bent or you look at a particular sect of judaism or anything that says that women are not partakers of these type of things i think that's just not real that's just not reality not so much real but it's not reality so we get here by the mercies of god to present your bodies as a living sacrifice and that's what i was talking about when we present our bodies before the lord and we're empty before the lord it's god who gives us the gifts Okay, so it says holy and acceptable to God. Again, holy is that word kadosh. We know kadosh means to be set apart. So we want to be set apart, okay, acceptable to God. How we are how are we acceptable to God? By walking according to his will. And if you guys remember my sermon several weeks, uh, several weeks now about the will of God, uh, fulfilling the will of God in our lives, it's laid out for us that if we simply walk according to God, God how God established his standards for our life, and we just simply do those. We carry out God's will in our life. So that becomes, so therefore we become acceptable vessels before God. It's really important. Which is your spiritual service? Now again, highlight this spiritual service, because this spiritual service just doesn't mean like in prayer. It just doesn't mean in the osmosis. 
It doesn't mean that, you know, I wish this will happen and then it happens. Type of thing. And we don't put spiritual on the idea here of, of it's out there in the heavens type of thing, or we're serving God in the heavens, but we can do whatever we want here. This word spiritual service that we have here really truly means to carry out God's will in a very practical way, which is a service. In a spiritual aspect of like being the kohanim, being the priest, being the uh, the uh, kedoshim, the holy ones before God, that we all serve Him as priests and priests before the Lord in in our sacrifices. We don't go to the temple anymore and sacrifice bulls and goats, but we do still go to the temple and offer our gifts to the Lord. And not only our financial gifts in the sense of tithing, but we offer our bodies as living sacrifices before the Lord. That we respond to what God is wanting to do in our lives together. Does everybody catch that? So it's important that we see spiritual gifts here is not something that just kind of is happening over there somewhere. It's us applying God to our lives. And and as we sent out says, now it tells us why or how. Verse two: Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We talked about, and this is why I spent so long on on the right side of the brain and why we talked about building community for seven weeks we dealt with this and the reason why that we dealt with this for that is to understand that we really should not walk in the gifts of god until we've built community and attachment to one another. and i think that's important for us to understand because corinthians we got to remember it was a, a romans and and especially in the first corinthians when we go to first corinthians can you say that again i didn't hear you we'll say what again you said that, that whole last part that you just said, okay, before you said Corinthians. Okay, uh, it's important for us to understand it, to have connection and being attached to one another. You remember we spent seven weeks talking about building community and the importance of getting our right brain active to our faith in God. When we just practice left brain uh, faith, we're Bible studying, we're, we're getting together, we're memorizing the word of God, we're praying, we're doing that stuff, that's great. We don't want to dismiss that because that's important. But when we don't get together and break bread and we don't find joy in each other and we don't express love and attach ourselves to one another to where we can actually, like at the men's meeting, you know, I was sharing with them that when I build attachment or relationship with them, that allows them to speak into my life and for me to speak into their life. And that allows me to bring correction when correction is needed in a loving way as opposed into an opposing way, okay? So, so when we have attachment to one another, we can speak into each other's lives and it's a lot easier to take correction in our lives when we have to take it, okay? And it's a lot easier to give it. If my wife and I have a relationship together, the more I spend time with her, the more she spends time with me and she recognizes something in me or I recognize something in her, that attachment that we have helps us to have this relationship that when we talk to each other, we're trying to speak to each other in a way that doesn't damage each other, but in a way that lifts us up. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, and we don't always, we are not always successful at it. <laughs> okay, but the reality is, is that we try to do it successfully because we're attached to one another, not just with our ring and not just in a physical way. Our, our souls are being attached to because we're, we're, we were friends way before we were lovers. And we were friends for a long time before we were lovers. And and so those that I mean when, when I mean lovers, I want to put the other half in there. Friends, married lovers. <laughs> I better bring in the reality here of the truth. I mean, I don't want to oh friends, lovers, married. No, no. Friends, marriage, lovers. Okay. So no, well, actually, friends betrothal, period, marriage, lovers. So we went through a betrothal. Okay, so uh, uh, so the Bible tells us here, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We spent seven weeks talking about that, so that you may discern. That's a heavy duty word. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what discernment means before, before we jump into discernment of spirits later on. What is the will of God? What is good and acceptable and perfect? Or also here, what is good and what is evil? Okay. A discernment is a gift of God for us to discern between good and evil, and that's important. So verse 3, for through the grace given me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but use sound judgment as God has assigned to each person the measure of faith. 
One of the reasons I spent seven weeks talking about what we talked about is that Christianity and many denominations out there, even including Messianic uh, Judaism, among Messianic Judaism, even Judaism, okay, all these kinds of things, we design our congregations around very narcissistic left brain ideas, okay? And uh, oh, here comes Jerk. So Jerk's joining us now. All right. Okay. So we we what we do is is we have congregations that are designed to form every one of us to think of of you know we we get delusions of grandeur. Okay. That was one of my favorite parts in Star Wars. You know when Chewbacca or I think it was Empire Strikes Back where Chewbacca and and Han Solo get caught and they get thrown into that little prison or whatever and. Uh, and one of them says, "Stop, you know, stop having delusions of grandeur or something like that." I think it was, it was uh, uh, Han Solo talking about that to, to Chewbacca. But it, it's it's true in our congregations today, in our society today, we have we have cultured narcissism. We have developed everybody can be whatever they want to be, and it can be great and perfect, and they can choose whatever they want to be. They can be whatever gender they want to be. They can be male. They can be female. If you're feeling like a man, you're a man. If you feel like a woman, you're a woman. Uh, we want to give you all um, trophies for participation. We've developed this thing that everybody can be great and all great all on their own. And unfortunately, our churches have not have not set that pace to, to fight that and have, have brought that in wholeheartedly. So I just wanted to say that. And I mean, examples, if some of you guys have examples, you can share some, but we developed a culture, a very self-driven, and I hate saying the term, but self-driven Christianity, but how do you put this into our thing? Messianicism, okay? That's the way how we would relate it in our ways of being Messianic Jewish. Um, so we have a culture that does that. Messianic Judaism, however, has a culture that is opposing to that if we practice it. If we practice what God gives us and we walk according to his ways, we will develop people that are really, really well-versed in scriptures, you know, getting the left brain involved, but also walking and breaking the bread and finding joy in each other's lives and, it's, and really encouraging one another. And when we do those two things and we do that, uh, we walk in tremendous uh, strength and we grow in God like we can't imagine. All right, so let's move on here. Um, let's see, but to use sound judgment. So let's not be people who think we have visions of grandeur. Hey, I'm going up to the mountain to meet Moses and God. And I got to make a sukkah up on the mountain. And that. <laughs> you know, I, well, you know, there's Moses, me, and then Jesus. Okay. And typically it's more like me, Jesus, and then Moses. You know, that's how most people think in a lot of ways. It's really strange, but it's, it's that. As God assigned to each person a measure of faith. So it says right here. Ah, uh, here comes Francita. Hola, or welcome. Eman, Eman, welcome. Welcome, my Jamaican friend. Welcome to the study tonight. Okay, so it says here, so let me read this again so you can catch this. Uh, we're in First Korean, or Romans chapter 12, verse, verse 3 now, for uh, those of you that just joined. For through the grace given me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. But to use sound judgment as God has assigned to each person a measure of faith. So if you take this, God has assigned a measure of faith. And then you look at verse 1, where it says, by the mercies of God. So God's given us the mercy, and he's given us the measure of faith to walk according to the gifts of the Spirit. Okay, and so and to, to the gifts in our life. Okay, and it says here, so that um, for just as we have many parts in one body, and all the parts do not have the same function. So we who are many are one body and Messiah and everyone parts of one another. What a great illustration. I think another illustration, modern illustration that I've used many times is an engine. An engine just doesn't have a bolt in it. It has many bolts in it. And not only many bolts, but precisely torqued down to the right, right strength to hold on the, the manifold, okay, to hold on the radiator. To hold on the uh, uh, the fans and the alternator, everything is designed on the engine to work in harmony. But there's so many different parts. And if you look at our body, we not only have a finger, but my finger has a whole different whole different job to do than my brain. 
and my stomach. I can't feed my finger. <laughs> but, but you know, it's like, um, so we can't feed our finger, but we can feed our stomach through our mouth. We can't just kind of open up our stomach and just get food in there. We have to go through here. Our mouth has a different action. It chews the food for us. Our, our you know, what do you call it? Subconsciously, we got muscles that work. Uh, that we swallow, we do a lot of things that we don't realize we're a, we're a functioning engine. And when one part of the body hurts, it all hurts, okay? So we have here, uh, so uh, parts of the body. Okay, so verse six of Romans chapter 12 for Leah, who just came on. Romans chapter 12, verse six. We have gifts that differ according to the grace that was given to us. So again, we see here God's mercy, God's measure of faith in our lives, and now we see here God's grace that was given to us. This is important to understand. This word grace, chesed, loving kindness, we talked about for a long time, could also be substituted with the word attached, right? Or attachment. So if he says here, we have gifts that differ according to the, to the grace or to the attachment that was given to us, that because God connects with us and he attaches himself to us he, and he, he created us and designed us, he knows what gifts are offer, should operate through us on a regular basis. He, he knows what he's done, and he knows the portion of faith that he's given each and every one of us. Okay, if prophet, now he goes in, so now we have the gifts coming up. If prophecy in proportion to our faith. So basically, if prophecy, prophesy according to the uh, faith that you've been given. Okay, in service, or if service in our serving, or the one who teaches in his teaching, or the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who gives in generosity, the one who leads with diligence. So basically saying if you've been the gift of give or, or the gift of giving, then give wholeheartedly. If you've been or generosity, if you've been given exhortation, then warm, um, exhort, you know, exhort and warm to we'll talk more about that later. Um, one who leads, then lead. And he says here with diligence, the one who shows mercy, do it with cheerfulness. Do it with joyfulness. And that's where Linda walks in that area. That was a surprise to her, and she does that all the time. She extends the mercy. Like, great. Uh, it's just wonderful. Okay, then, and then it says, let love be without hypocrisy, detesting what is evil, holding fast to the good. Okay, detesting what is evil, and this, you, you do it because of discernment. So God still wants to give us discernment in this whole process to walk according to God's will that we see up there in verse two. In verse two. Be tenderly devoted to one another in brotherly love. Outdo one another in giving honor. <laughs> love it. Love it. Outdo one another. That's all. Oh, blessings to you, my sister. No, blessings to you, my brother. No, to you, sister. No, to you, my brother. <laughs> oh, yeah, may, may God bless you. Oh, you over, know, and over. over and over and over. Oh, oh, I'm attached to you, right? No, 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 no. I am attached to you, brother. You know, it's like, can you imagine just giving honor where honor is due, but going above and beyond it? You know? And it, it's interesting. It's like uh, when we see somebody not act in honor towards the brother and sister, it's kind of sad in a way. You know, uh, I don't understand why young, this younger generation, does, they don't really care about the older people in our community. They don't really want to hold the door open or let somebody, um, um, uh, you, know, hold, you know, hold the door or help them if they drop something or something like that. It's really sad. The scriptures say, you know, go above and beyond it. Try to outdo one another in honor. I think that's fantastic. Okay, verse 11. Do not be lagging in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Keeping, keep serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, enduring in distress, enduring in distress. That's kind of a weird translation. It's hard to speak out loud. Persisting in prayer, contributing to the needs of the Kedoshim, and extending hospitality. Okay, so contributing to the needs of the Holy Ones or the set apart ones to the believers. That's interesting that that's kind of specific in there. Why is it because we're brothers and sisters and we're part of God's mishpacha? We're part of the mishpacha of, uh, you know, Shel Elohim, where we're the family of God. And when we take care of brothers and sisters and we extend our grace and our honor and our love and our generosity to one another, God recognizes that we are actually loving one another the way we should. Okay, so we get down to verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Now, here's what's interesting. A lot of people get confused on this. Why do I want to bless somebody who's cursing me? Why do I want to be a blessing to somebody who's cursing me? Really, what it is is when you, you extend graciousness 
and you extend kindness to that person, and when you extend uh, and you bless them, when you do that, you're not actually saying, God, pour out your riches upon that person. God, let that person just become a great person. Let that person just walk in all, all wonderfulness and great. That's not really what it's saying. When you bless someone who curses you, you're actually praying that God will move in that person's life. And when you ask God to pour out his blessings upon them, what is God going to do with somebody who's prideful? Is he going to get somebody more pride? No. What are you going to do with somebody who's rude? Is he God going to give them more rudeness? He's going to take that person down to the nitty gritty of their soul. And he's going to remove it from them. And that's really important for us to understand. So when we pray or we bless someone who's cursed us, um, in the sense of just somebody who's just evil or mean to you and you just bless them and you say, you know, God loves you and stuff like that. God starts breaking down that pride. He starts breaking down that rudeness. He starts breaking down whatever he needs to to bless that person to become a believer in him because he's long-suffering. He's patient to wait that all men and women come to him and, and find salvation. So when we take the time to honestly bless people who, who hurt us, we're not blessing them for God to give them riches and give, you know, be, you know, all lovey-dovey with them and, and put them on his lap. I mean, yeah, obviously we want that to happen for, for people who are with the Lord, but it's, it's an unbeliever and they're cursing you and you're doing that. God's going to use that blessing to bring, to bring them to repentance. So that's important for us to understand that, okay? So it says, rejoice with those who rejoice. Amen. I hate, I hate being around people who are sore losers and I hate being around people who are sore winners. Sore winners love to rub it in your face that you lost. Sore losers can't rejoice with somebody who just won. Right? We need to be the opposite. When we see God deliver somebody and they get delivered of sin or they get delivered of whatever, we need to rejoice with that person. When they get set free or their family is finally seeing God bring their whole family together, we've got to rejoice with that. Instead of sitting there, you know, one of the worst things to do is sit there and say, well, why doesn't that ever happen to me? That's a bad attitude, and that's one, and then that's why it never happens to you. <laughs> God's going to keep testing your your uh, your resolve, and He's going to keep keep giving you opportunities to become a better person. And yet, if you never realize that, you're going to keep always you're going to be the person like, well, how come that never happens to me? Why does that person always get blessed? Or why does that couple always get? Uh, why do they always seem happy? You know, or why do they always have money? Or why does this person do this? Or why does that person? You know, that's an attitude that God really has, to, there has to be some repentance and possibly even deliverance from, from feeling ashamed or rejected growing up or something. It can go even deeper into a childhood process in your life because there's something that you have to deal with if, if you're like that. So if you can't rejoice in someone else's victories, there's something wrong there. Okay, we should always rejoice in some, when somebody gets a raise, you know, and or if you're, you're barren and you wanted children your whole life and you're married and you can't have children, and then somebody else has a child. Um, I actually prayed for a couple up in New York, New York City years ago. Um, I was visiting at uh, Beth on Messiah, the Messiah Foundation in New, uh, New City, New York, which is outside of New York City, which is funny, but it's called New City, New York. And you have to go over the GW Bridge, go a little bit north on through Jersey and then back into New York. And then your uh, New City is in that area by Muncie. It's a big Jewish community. If anything, but anyhow, I was at this community, I was at this congregation praying, and and these people came to me and they had heard that I had prayed for people to get pregnant, and so I I, I said yeah I would love to pray for them. We were actually having lunch. It was during a, a conference and there was lunch going on, and um, uh, uh, they came to me and I sat down with them. So I said, well, you know, who do you believe gives life? And they said, well, we believe God gives life. I said, okay, well let's pray. And they hadn't been able to have children. Uh, she was older than him. And they hadn't been able to have children. So I prayed for them and prayed that God would bless them. And as I was praying for them, uh, later on, I mean, I prayed for them, but I didn't feel like the Lord was going to answer this prayer. I was getting a word of knowledge. And it's like, okay, Lord, reveal to me kind of what's going on here. And and I was getting this, like she's holding something against somebody. Like there was something that she hadn't dealt with. And I ended up talking to him about, um, about, three or four days later, and I said, you know, i got to tell you, I prayed for you guys to, to get, to have a child, but there's something that's holding me back, and I, I said, there's something going on, 
And I said, I don't know what it is. And she said, I said, I got a word of knowledge that you're kind of holding something and, and or struggling with her. And she says, yeah, I said, she goes, uh, my sister has had her third child now and I haven't been able to have a child. And it just kind of concerns me because I haven't been able to have a child and I'm bummed about it. And I'm like, well, I said, are you holding any resentment towards your sister? And she goes, yeah, I guess I am. I guess I, I, I just don't understand why I can't, I can't get pregnant. And, and I said, well, you need to, to repent of that attitude and you need to rejoice with your sister. And I said, when you do that, God will open up your womb. Okay. It was very brave. Just stay right out. Because I, I felt like there was something that was keeping her from getting pregnant. And we repented together. I helped lead her in repentance and brought her to a place of repentance for that. She was in tears. Me and her husband were meeting at a coffee shop a couple of days later when this came up. And um, we were there and I prayed for them and we talked and stuff. And, and um, a year later, they sent me pictures of twins. Okay. They had twins. So God opened her womb and blessed her with two children. And, and partly, I believe, is because she was already in her 40s or getting into her 40s. And I think she was 41 at that time. But because she dealt with what she had to do with, God opened up her womb and she gave twins or, or birth to twins. And they're beautiful, beautiful kids. I think I've shown Linda the picture of the children. So um, that's great. So um, so you never know what God's going to do. So when we um, don't be a sore loser, okay? When God starts blessing people around you, rejoice with them. Says weep with those who weep. Okay. Self-explanatory. Live live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Verse 16. Now verse 17. Repay no no one evil for evil. Give thought to what is good in the eyes of all people. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live in shalom with all people. Now, why do you think it says that? If possible. And if possible, so far as it depends on you. You know, a lot of times we sow seeds that we don't realize we're going to reap a harvest of bad stuff. And we want to live in shalom. Why can't people just love me? Or why can't people just pay attention to me? Well, when you cut somebody off or you're rude to somebody or you're mean to somebody, that's going to come back. That harvest is going to come back. And if it's up to you to decide how you treat somebody else, and it's up to you to decide what you're going to do in your life and the the seeds that you plant, then live in shalom with those things. Think, okay, oh, this is what I can say. This is what I can do. Um, you know, it, so work on that. Uh, verse 19, never take out or never take your own revenge, loved ones, but give room for God's wrath. <laughs> okay, this is not preached about very often. But when somebody wrongs you, don't get in the way of God doing, taking care of it. That's really what it says. God will take care of you. And believe it or not, God will step in at times and pour out wrath on people's lives. Not in a huge way, but we know at the end days, he's going to do it, right? In the end days, he's going to pour out his wrath in a powerful way. And what we want to do is get out of the way when he does it. It's not my job to bring vengeance on anybody. But I'll tell you what, when you get out of the way, God's wrath brings repentance in this time frame. There's going to be, an offer, there's going to be something that's going to take place in the future that when he comes back and he breaks through his clubs and he gathers his elect and he brings them into his presence, there's not going to be much, there's, there's not going to be an opportunity for repentance at a certain point. It's going to be closed off. But the reality is, is that between now, don't get in God's way. If he loves you, he'll take care of you. He'll, he'll deal with something. Um, so I can't say, I don't get mad, I get even. <laughs> and I hear that a lot. Um, yeah, I don't get mad. I just get Stephen. So, yeah, I don't get mad. Time. I just pray. <laughs> yeah. That's what I do. The way, the way we pray is important too. We don't want to start praying and say, "God, pour down your wrath on these people. Pour, <laughs> no. pour down your and your lightning. Strike them dead, oh Lord." <laughs> <laughs> I just say, "Oh Lord, please give us peace." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. That's, it. that's what it is. So that's how we want to approach it. Okay. And then it says here, never take your out, take your own revenge, loved ones, but you know, give room for God's wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says Adonai. Rather, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For by doing so, you will keep coals of fire upon his head. That's just a, a Hebraic 
uh, Hebraicism of what? It's very simple. You guys know what it's saying. What do you guys think it's saying here? Heap of coals upon his head. Anger. Ain what? Anger. Possibly. Linda? I have heard it said that in the morning they would carry coals to other folks' houses so they could start the first fire in the morning. So it was a blessing of heat that you were taking to somebody's house, what I've heard. Okay, that's interesting. Look at the context, okay? Look what it says here. Rather, so it's telling you here, instead of taking out vengeance on someone, it says, rather, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. So you're doing the opposite. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For by doing so, you will heap coals upon his head. What you're basically doing is allowing this person to realize that um, that you, you love, you're bringing God's love in this person's life. And it, it it brings what do you call it to him? Uh, like you don't repay evil with evil. So what you're doing is you're not playing their game. You're showing you're showing the love and the grace of God. So it actually it, this is referring to conviction. This is referring to guilt for treating you because it talks about your enemy there and someone who's mistreating you. So when you take the opportunity to bless them by giving them something to drink or giving them food if they're you know, if they're hungry or if they're thirsty, you're giving them a drink. What you're doing is you're allowing that person now to deal with their own junk. Okay, and come before the Lord and say, Wow, I'm, I really treat this person bad. Um, I need to I need to change my attitude about that person. Okay, so I see it differently than you guys, but what you guys said is good. Okay. Um, and verse 21, do not overcome evil, or do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And that's really what it is, is that when you start doing that. You start making the choices that, that the spiritual gifts are designed for you. So let's take a look at the gifts here. Write this down if you're taking notes. There's seven gifts that are mentioned just in this passage. Seven gifts. I like the color, so I'm going to put it the first time so you can see the cute little colors. Can you guys see the cute little colors here? All right. So the first one is prophecy. We all know that God speaks through prophets, but he can speak through you if you're that vessel. For those of you that tuned in a little bit later, um, I was talking about how this coffee cup isn't just a cup. It just doesn't hold liquids, and we drink it. But this cup could be used to hold ice cream. It could be used as an instrument to play music. It can be uh, used as a plant holder to put soil in here and, and put flowers in there and grow flowers. This cup can be used in many. It can be used as a weapon. Uh, that's one I didn't bring up earlier. So this this cup can be used in many many different ways. So if we are open and empty vessels before the Lord, God can use us in many ways. Okay, so that's what we have to understand. He can use us any way he wants, but he gives us particular gifts. For example, that cup can be used many ways, but it's used a particular way most of the time. We are the same way. God will use you in a particular way most of the time in your life. Okay, but that doesn't mean he won't use you for other means if you don't, if you allow him to. So if you desire to prophesy, prophesy. Ask the Lord to give you the gift of prophecy. To, to start listening to the Spirit of God. When you're praying, take time to be still and just hear God. If you hear one word, even just one word, meditate on that one word and try to see what God is trying to speak to you. If he gives you a scripture for some, and then someone comes to mind, I get pictures. So this is how God speaks to me. I get pictures. Okay, so I see a picture of a person. or And then I see a picture of of a prophetic word, which is really interesting, like a car getting in an accident or something like that. And I get a picture of a person or I get a scripture, you know, not just a simple John, I'm sitting there writing John 3, 16. No, I might get like Hosea 1, 1, 1. And then I'm like, what does that say? And then I'm looking it up. And as soon as I look it up, God gives me a person. And it's like, okay, the Lord wants me to give this person a prophetic word regarding that. Now that's a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom that you can give them or even a scripture passage. But when God starts prophesying to you, it can come out in different ways. And now some of you have been with uh, Sophia, so she's gone through this whole process of each one of these. So I don't want to belabor any of these things. But prophetic words can be uh, words that bring encouragement. They can bring um, repentance. They can bring um, uh, uh, future events in your life. Like, you know, God's going to use you for a particular way. And I would encourage you to write those down. Take a look at them. Okay? So prophecy... 
And it says here, if you receive the word of prophecy, do it in proportion to your faith. If your faith is, is, is a mustard seed size, okay, take that mustard seed size of prophecy in your life and ask God to develop that. Start working with that, okay? Number two is service. If God has given you the gift of service, serve, okay? There's nothing wrong with it. We need serve, servers in our congregation. We need people to help with on this. We need people to help with audio visual. Don't ever think that by doing that, that somehow that dismisses or diminishes your gifting and your calling in your life compared to somebody who's a teacher or somebody who's a prophet. The gift of service is powerful. It's powerful. And it's so powerful that the apostles said, listen, we need to take people who are filled with the Holy Spirit and with wisdom. Remember in the book of Acts, we need to bring people to serve tables, just to be servers for the community of God. They wanted people filled with the Holy Spirit and wise and strong and, and have a strong faith to step in that place of being deacons and serving because it was important for them to understand that what they were doing was just as important as these guys uh, uh, seeking the Lord and, and, and trying to come up with what the scriptures are teaching them to do to help lead. It's very important. If, if, if I spent all my time setting up Oneg and taking down Oneg and running the audio visual and then ran up there and tried to preach really back, back or fast and I get off and I go back and I do all that stuff and I'm the only one that's doing something in the congregation, Number one, I'll get burned out. <laughs> Couldn't do that for very long. Number two, I mean, like, who are these people I'm, be, I'm, I'm speaking to? Because they're not listening one finger to help, you know? And number three, it's like, what the heck I'm doing? I'm, go I'm quitting. I'm going to the beach. Okay, that's, that's, that's where I would get with that. So it's important for us all to understand that we all play a role, but one does not diminish the other. My pinky is just as important as my brain in my life. I can live without my pinky, but I can't live without my brain. But sometimes my brain wants to do everything or thinks that I can do everything just by willpower or my hair. But no, I, I have to get up off the couch and use my two legs to walk to the bathroom, right? I can't just think about it and it happens. So my mind's like, hey, just, just think about it. And for osmosis, it'll be gone. It'll be done. No, no, I got to get up and go. So our body plays different parts all the time. So if, you're, if you have a gift of service, I encourage you to serve wholeheartedly and be beautiful in that. Number three, teaching. Maybe you're not led to teach adults. You're led to teach children. And then even more so specifically, maybe you're led to teach women. Or you're led to teach just men. Okay? Maybe God is moving you in a place to actually teach actual students in college and to impart on them beautiful truth from a biblical perspective. And God's calling you to do that. So if you have the gift of teaching, really ask God what what area here do you want to develop in my life regarding that teaching because it, it just because you have to get teaching doesn't mean you could teach everything and anything you have a gift and ability to do that but god may make it very specific in your life linda is a very good teacher of, of of skiing she taught me how to ski and she did a great job with it part of it is i had to be a really good student but she was a good teacher that allowed me to be a good student the other aspect is, is she loves to teach children especially the three to five year olds she loves it. There's a connection that she gets with them. She loves to be with them. She hasn't been able to get out there and do that because she's beyond the audio visual and she learned how to run it. And she does a great job of doing the, the power slide. Um, if you don't see the slide doing well, sometimes because she's training younger kids to do it and that kind of thing, sometimes it can get confusing. But when she's running them, they're running very smoothly. So, so teaching is do it. Okay. Fourth is exhortation. This means to give warning or advice to. Okay. That's what it really means. It means to, to press, to encourage, to nudge people, to prompt them, okay? So this is, the, or to give an, an urgent appeal. I exhort you to fall on your faces and repent before the Lord. The word exhort comes from a, uh, it comes, it comes from a, uh, from way back. It's an old English word that really the pastors loved it, but it was their way of giving or you know oratorial is that the right oral oral presentations oratory. of exhorting oratory like tell and repent for the kingdom of god is near john the baptist was an exhorter okay so if you think of john the baptist you know telling um warning um herod hey repent of what you're doing you know repent of what you're doing to your to your wife and your 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 brother's wife and, and all this kind of stuff repent that's exhortation 
Okay, so it's, it's doing that. It's pressing and encouraging people with strong warnings. Uh, repent from this, you know, Yeshua. We saw Yeshua did it. He says, uh, who, who caused you to flee from this generation? Remember when he was exhorting the Pharisees? Okay, and there were several times where he did it. He threw over the tables and he exhorted them. This is the house of prayer. My, or my, my father's house will be called the house of prayer. Okay, so he was giving them an exhortation. He was warning them, repent of what's going on in their life. Okay, number five, give. Giving, and here what's beautiful is, is Shaul says, "Give generously, generously." What, which means, if you have the ability to give, give and give above and beyond if you can. Be generous with your giving. Don't just stop and say, "Well, I gave my ten percent this year, or I gave my ten percent uh, uh, for the month, and I just don't have any left over." Um, not just give to your congregation, but give to your brothers and sisters in Messiah. Give to other things. Uh, we recently, as a congregation, decided as leaders to help out the fight in Ukraine, and we sent uh, um, we sent um, um, uh, Samaritan's Purse that's ran by Franklin Graham because he's there on the on the ground. We sent them uh, some money as a congregation. So you, as part of Beth Yeshua, uh, stepped into the role of blessing uh, Ukraine uh, for people who are meaning food and water and triage, care and healing and compassion, and just everything, surgeries or whatever's going on there, we as a congregation gave to um, Samaritans first. So give generously. Don't be somebody who's stingy, okay? That's called an evil lie. The scriptures call it an evil lie. That's the, uh, that's the, the it, it's ein ra, or it's ra ein in Hebrew. And that means evil lie. That means to be stingy. We want to be somebody who's who's uh tova, or we want to be good eyes. We want to have a good eye, which means generous. Okay, so get uh, six leadership, and then it says here, lead diligently. Be serious about your work to lead, and that means feeding children as well. That means leading workers. If you own a business or you have you're in charge of something, be diligently leading others uh, as you go along. Okay, be diligent. Seven, mercy. Show it cheerfully or in complete joy. Think about that for a minute. Okay, so now um, let's jump to 1 Corinthians and take a look. So just flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Same chapter. That's what's fun about Romans 12 and Corinthians chapter 12. It's easy to remember where they're at. You just go to each one of them. Corinthians chapter 12, I'm going to take some time to read um, on that one. Okay, now, uh, now concerning spiritual gifts. So spiritual gifts for the body. So we just read... We saw seven of them listed in Romans, and there's one that overlaps, um, which is prophecy that you'll see in here, but there's several others that are coming out, okay? So now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, again, brothers and sisters, for those of you that tuned in late, when it talked about the gifts in Romans chapter 9, and it talks about the gifts in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it uses the term brothers and sisters. Amen? God's gifting can work through anyone that is B'nai Yisrael, part of the commonwealth of Israel. Whether you're male or female, you can be used as a vessel of God to carry out the work of God. It's important to write that down, underscore that, because there's some denominations that don't allow women to do anything. There's some Jewish sects that don't allow women to do anything. Okay? Um, my wife was giving me a hard time yesterday and i said women should be silent until they're uh, at home with their husbands i go wait wait we are at home <laughs> nanny nanny <laughs> i lost that battle right from the get-go <laughs> so <laughs> anyhow uh i do not want you to be ignorant agnoeo is the greek word agnoeo means to not know not having knowledge so he's saying here listen now concerning spiritual gifts brothers and sisters I don't want you to go without knowing really God's ways with it. You know that when you were pagan, you were enticed by idols that not can speak, that cannot speak, and you got led astray. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Ruach Elohim, the Spirit of God, says Yeshua be cursed. And no one can say Yeshua is Lord except by the Ruach HaKodesh. Now, there are various kinds of gifts but the same Ruach, the same Spirit. There are various kinds of service, but the same Adonai, the same Lord. 
There are various kinds of working, but the same kind, the same God who works all things in all people. Now, I want you to circle various. I want you to underline it because there's a lot of teachers out there that talk about oneness of these gifts. And I think that they're missing the key here. They're missing a point. And what I mean by that is if it's prophecy, it can only be done a certain way. If it's leadership, it can only be done a certain way. When it says various kinds of things here, we have to understand that God creates things in its time, right? If you look at a dog today, there's so many varieties of dogs out there, from small, little, pesky, to mean, to loving, to kind, you, you name it. But all these different breeds of dogs are still part of the same kind. What is that same kind? They're canine, right? There's tons and tons of cats out there including the lions and tigers and you name it all that stuff they're still part of the feline they're still part of that kind that kind that god created but there's various kinds so oftentimes when we see god moving through somebody it can be it can be presented in a way that doesn't seem the same exact way with someone else okay and that's where we have to understand that just because this person is doing it a little differently doesn't mean that that's not God doing it. Because there's various kinds of each one of them. So it does say this. So it says, uh, the same God who works all things in all people, but to each person is given. Okay, where am I at? Um, okay, verse five again. There are various kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are various kinds of working um, or serving, but the same God who works all things in all people. But to each person is given the manifestation of the Ruach for the benefit of all. Highlight that number on line it. You've heard me talk about this many times before, that when we attach ourselves to one another as we are a building community, everything that is moving and operating through us is not for us. I hate to say that. I hate being selfish on this, but I'm going to say this. Okay? Let's say Rebecca, or let's use Jared okay, um, has a gift of hospitality. I'm going to use that hospitality for my advantage, not his advantage. <laughs> Basically, what I mean by that is I want his hospitality to be poured out into my lap, and I want to see God use him, and that way because it's a benefit for all of us, not necessarily for him. You guys see what I'm saying? If I have the gift of faith that, that can help us cross a bridge that looks really shaky or something like that, it's for the benefit of everybody else that I have the gift of faith that we can walk across. It's not just for me. So our gifts don't, our gifts in many ways aren't just designed for us. The gift of giving. What if I just gave money to Linda money just, and Linda gave it back to me and I gave it back to her and she gave it back to me. And we just kept giving each other gifts back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. What are we doing? We're not giving. We're being stingy or selfish, right? Our gift of giving extends to the body of believers and it's for the benefit of all so your gifts that god gives you is for the benefit of all okay hello christina goodbye christina had to be a big hug from dad yay hi good to see you we're waiting on have a good evening okay so we see that on there okay so where am i at um the benefit of all verse eight for to one is given through the spirit so again the Spirit of God is the one who's directing these things. A word of wisdom. And I'll tell you, the word of wisdom is like choice morsel. It's like a, a ribeye steak that, that Rabbi Adrian has cooked. <laughs> you guys have not ever had one of my ribeyes? Just ask Rabbi Barsky. Okay. Uh, he, yeah, he, he, he made drool. He made drool. Yeah. yeah. If you start yes. saying, uh, do you like uh, rib, uh, Adrian's, uh, Rabbi Adrian's rib, ribeye? He's like, he's got, it's, it's like, oh, cool. He's gonna, oh, yeah. you know, he, he's gonna stand up and start dancing. No, but anyhow, I'm just just messing around here. Okay, but a word of knowledge is like a choice morsel like that. When you've been given a word of knowledge from someone, I tell you, man, it's like the best thing on the planet. And when God uses you to give a word of wisdom, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing because you are giving somebody a word from God at a very precise moment that will help them go right or left in their life. It's that precise. It's it's so beautiful. And it could be a scripture, just to, just even a simple, but it could also be something that's very, 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 very simple, okay? Um, word of wisdom. 
So now there is the word of knowledge according to the same Ruach. Knowledge is another one. And we're going to talk a little bit about what that means. To another faith by the same Ruach. To another gifts of healing by the one Ruach. To another workings of miracle. You've radically changed somebody's life. That's what a miracle is. God shows up. <laughs> their life is never the same. Okay? Do you think the guy at the gate, the, at the gate, uh, the beautiful gate, this is what we forget when we read in the book of Acts of, of who was it? Um, Peter and um, Peter and John are headed to the temple for Shacharit, for, for their daily prayers. And they're on the way to the temple. They come across a guy who's been crippled for 40 years since birth, sitting at the gate beautiful. How many times do you think Yeshua walked by that guy? We forget about that scene. Doesn't say in the scripture, but Yeshua walked by, had to go through the gate beautiful many times when he came into Jerusalem. That guy was sitting there too. Why wasn't that guy healed? That's, a, that's an important question. Sometimes God leaves things just for us to do. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. God has left opportunities for you to participate in the kingdom of God with him to work a miracle in somebody's life. And they say to him, you know, you know, uh, you know, silver and gold, we do not have, but what we have, we give you in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah, rise up and walk. And they reached out. And that guy became whole at that instant. He began to jump up and down. He began to get healed. And all this kind of stuff happened. Yeshua must have walked by him at least once. And this guy was begging for alms for 40 years, he said, at the gate beautiful. I think it's 40. Am I correct in that? If I can remember. I'm just pulling it out of my head trying to remember. But I think he was there. He was like for many, many years. So God left an opportunity. Or Yeshua, even more specific, the Messiah, left an opportunity for John and, and Peter to participate in the kingdom of God and change, radically change a person's life for the rest of their life. That's a miracle. That's somebody, when you walk in miracles of God and, and it's through the spirit of God and you do that, you change somebody's life for the rest of their life. When they've been healed of cancer, when they've been, um, when they've been healed of certain things or, or there was a miraculous thing that took place. My mom uh, moves tremendously, not so much in, the, in miracles, but in prophetic. She's got a prophetic sense, but she can wake up at two o'clock in the morning. She woke up one time at two o'clock in the morning praying for my older brother. It was like it was a burden to her to pray for my older brother. She woke up around two or three o'clock. My older brother was in Nevada with his uh, with my cousins and all that kind of stuff, and they had been partying or doing whatever, and they all were drunker than you would you wouldn't believe. And as they were coming to a T junction, they're going they're on like a charger, and as they're coming up to this T junction, they had to go right or left because there was nothing but a field that's out there and a big fence that blocked it, so they had to turn. And my brother was sitting in the back seat and right around two o'clock in the morning, my mom's up praying for him, felt led to pray for him. She started to pray for him, started to pray for him, for him to be safe, and all that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden he said in his mind around that same time is that, uh, is that he felt like he kept hearing the word, put on your seatbelt, put on your seatbelt. So he reached over and as he was putting on his seatbelt, as soon as he was starting to click it in, they were in their first roll. Because the other person driving, I think, was my cousin, turned around the corner and it put him in their first roll. They rolled, they rolled like, uh, uh, they rolled six or seven times. They covered a, a span of like 400 feet or something like that, rolling. My cousin was thrown out of the window and he was 250 ahead or 250 feet in front of the car when it came to a stop. My older brother was the only one in the car that was strapped down in uh, that. Two people, I think, broke their back. He got out of the car and he was able to help them and get everybody out of the way and away from the crash and do that, that kind of thing. And he was able to do all that. And um, even though that was, it was a miracle that he survived, it was a miracle that they all survived. But many of them were, were beat up pretty bad in that process. But my, God used my mom, woke her up, prayed, and I think that my brother was safe for that very reason. Because the way he was sitting, that part of the car, I mean, everything. It was like uh, he would have been, uh, it, could have been, it could have been bad. So anyhow, when God uses you, especially in the, in the uh, works or the, uh, um, what do you call it, uh, miracles, please walk in it and, and do what God's calling you to do. So to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, and we'll talk about that, to another different kinds of tongues. I love that one. 
to another the interpretation of tongue. So there are two different things here. Okay, but one in the same ruach activates all of these things, distributing to each person individually as he wills. So again, this is all about God. This is not about us. This is all about God for the benefit of all in, in our in our mishpacha, in our in our messianic community, in our family. So we have to understand that God's calling us to to be open vessels for him. And as we're open vessels for him, he's going to give us jobs to do. And he's going to give us things to accomplish. And he's going to give us gifts. And we all should be able to be open and understand that the supernatural becomes reality and natural in our lives. We have to understand. Okay. Praying for somebody should be common among believers. Praying for somebody to be healed should be a common reality in our walk. Um, desiring to prophesy over someone and give them a word should be a natural thing in our walk with God. If you've been given that gift, develop it. Develop it. Okay? Whatever gift God has given you, develop it. So it says here, and it's according to his will, not ours. For just as the body is one and has many parts, verse 12, and all the parts of the body through many, Though many are one body, so also is Messiah. For in one ruach we were all immersed into one body, whether Jewish or Greek, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one ruach. That's beautiful. For the body is not one part, but many. If the foot says, since I am not a hand, I am not part of the body, it is therefore not part of the body, or therefore is it not part of the body? And if the ear says, since I'm not an eye, I'm not part of the body, is it for this reason any less part of the body? So it's just going through this process of doing that, okay? Um, uh, but it talks about here, and then we'll jump down to uh, verse 18. But now God has placed in the parts, each one of them, in the body, just as he desired. Again, it's about him, and it's about what he wants to accomplish for the benefit of all of us. If they were all one part, where would the body be? But now there are many parts, yet one body. Okay? The eye cannot tell the hand, I don't need you. Or in turn, the head to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be less important are indispensable. You ever get a paper cut on your finger? <laughs> You're in pain a lot. Everything you touch seems to be on that one finger. Right? <laughs> and then it gets swollen or it starts getting, uh, what do you call it? Uh, sore and then gets infected and it gets big and red and you're like oh my gosh you take some hydrogen peroxide and you pour it on there and it bubbles up for like an hour you're like oh my goodness you know you got to take care of it before it gets fed and infested and just starts turning into something that's bad well when you when you bump your finger like that it's amazing how many times you actually bump your finger throughout the day and don't realize it until it's hurt so we can't really say that one part of our body is less important than another you know uh, i hear i hear women say this all the time or i hear rabbis and pastors say this all the time I may be the head of my house, but my wife's the neck. <laughs> if she's the one that controls that head. And if I get out of control, she, she, she knocks me upside down. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people say it. But the reality is that we're called to be one in the sign. We both are encouraged to help each other. Okay, we don't control each other like that. But um, anyhow, we go through this whole process. Um, so he goes down here. Um, and let's see if we just go. Because I'm trying to look at the time. I want us to be... Um, uh, faithful to the time. So verse 26, if one part suffers, all the parts suffer together. If one part is honored, all the parts rejoice together. Now you are the body of Messiah and members individually. God has put into his community first emissaries, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then healings, helps, leadership, and various kinds of tongues. All are not emissaries, are they? So what he's saying here, not everybody's an apostle, okay, right? Are all not prophets, are they? Not everybody's a prophet. Are all not teachers, or all are not teachers, are they? Not everybody should presume to be a teacher, for you'd be held twice accountable. All are not work, but all do not work miracles, do they? All do not have gifts of healing, do they? All do not speak in tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? But earnestly desire the greater gifts, and still I show you a far better way. So he's basically saying, desire the greater gifts, love supersedes all of it. But here's a beautiful thing, that when you walk according to God in love, and you attack yourselves to your brothers and sisters, and we are open vessels for God, it's love and the motivation, motiva motivation and the direction of God for us to accomplish um, his will 
by extending the gift that God has given us that relate to our brothers and sisters through love and, and Messiah, and therefore it's for the benefit of all of us, okay? So we have more gifts there. So let me just bring those up and talk about those there for a second. So we have um, my, excuse me for a second, these crazy shows, okay. Um, all right, so we have more here, benefit of all. So we have word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and we see that also in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 1 through 3, and in verses 8, and in chapter 14, verse 6, word of knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, workings of miracles. And then again, we have prophecy listed in here. Discerning of spirits. Okay, and we'll talk about that. And then we see various kinds of tongues and the interpretation of tongues. And then we have at the bottom down there where it says that we got you right there. You can add to that list here uh, that God has put in his community also specific callings. And when he starts doing those, some apostles or emissaries, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles with uh, then healings, helps, leadership, and various kinds of tongues. We see in Ephesians chapter what? Four? Ephesians chapter two. I believe it says that God has called some to be apostles prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And when you look at these gifts, they kind of go right along with that. Evangelists do a lot of miracles with healing. I don't know if you guys have seen something like Reinhard Bonnke, an evangelist, Reinhard Bonnke, who, who God has used to bring, if not millions, but thousands upon thousands and thousands of people to the Lord. Um, and he gets, he gets words of healing all the time and does that. Helps, leadership, those fall into the pastoral gifting. And various kinds of tongues fall into uh, the teacher's gifts as well and all those kinds of things. So we have the, the fivefold ministry is what they call it. Um, and I think it's Ephesians. Could be it is, yeah. Ephesians? Four. Ephesians 4, verse 11. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it says, He himself gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets or emissaries, some to be prophets, some as proclaimers of the good news, which are evangelists, some as shepherds, which are pastors, and then teachers to equip the coaching for the work of service for the building up the body of Messiah. So there's a continuity in the scriptures. It's all about the benefit of all. It's all part of this mishpacha that God desires. So our giftings and your giftings aren't for you. They're for the body of Messiah. And it's important that you attach yourself to the body of Messiah and not be a lone ranger because that is not God's will. But right, read what it says here. I love this. Verse 27. Go back to verse 27 of First Corinthians chapter 12. When we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we look at verse 27. It says, now you are the body of Messiah, speaking corporately. Right after that, he says this, and members individually. This is really important. When someone does not connect to a local body of believers, they shouldn't be used in the presence of our, in, in our presence to, to walk according to the, the gifts of God because they're not attaching themselves to us. They're not being a member of us in the sense of being Mishpacha. Do we have to be members of a particular congregation? No. But you should still attach yourself to that congregation. You should be willing to grow and to cry and to rejoice and to weep and to honor and to love one another and see how hard it is sometimes to love your brothers and sisters in a loving way because you've become committed to a body of believers. It's important. That when we jump around and go, well, well, Rabbi, I, I go here on Sunday, I go there on Tuesday, yet I just come here on, on, on Shabbat occasionally. But you know, I'm just a free spirit. And God just, the Holy Spirit just leads me wherever He wants to lead me. You know what? That's not the Holy Spirit leading me. I just, I got to be open and honest about it. That's not the Holy Spirit. That's your, that's your own desire to not be accountable to a group of people and to honor one another in God's way. God will always connect us to a local body of believers. He will always do that. That is his character. That is his nature. Do you have to sign on the dotted line? No. No. Will we like you to? Sure. But but really, your commitment to us at Beth Yeshua is that you're committed to a group, a body of believers, that you're going to share and partake in this mishpacha together. That we're going to be a, a family together. And that's so important. And that's important that we all do that. So I want to encourage you guys to do it. So let's take a look at each of these gifts here. 
And like I said here, before we close, what I'm going to do is ask you guys to send me your, an email um, and I'm going to email you guys a gift assessment, spiritual gift assessment thing. And for those of you that tuned in later, it's 125 or later, but I was sharing with a uh, couple of people that tuned in earlier before we started recording. It's a gift assessment test. It's 125 questions. It's self-explanatory. Don't overthink it. Okay. The questions on there are going to be uh, simple, kind of like if I just read, uh, let me just read a couple of these questions to you. Okay. So if I open it up and I read, um, now I can't find questions. Okay, so everybody unlock their mics right now because I want to hear this. Okay, so number three, you would write down the three if it's if it's often. If it's sometimes, you would write down a two. Okay, so you write down a two if it's sometimes. Okay, if it's if it's seldom, you write down a one, and if it's never, you write down a zero. So let me just ask a couple of questions here so you get an idea of it. I am verbally encouraging to those who are wavering, troubled, or discouraged. You are what? This, this is the question to you, not to me. I am verbally encouraging to those who are wavering, troubled, or discouraged. Now, does this often, that something that happens to you? Sometimes, occasionally, or, or um, uh, what's the word? Never. never. I mean, not, not never, seldom, and then never. Okay, so you give yourself three for oftentimes, two for sometimes, three or one for seldom, and zero for never. Okay, so here's another one. I have interpreted tongues in a way that is not divisive. If that is not never, what? Yeah, not divisive. So okay. if you've never interpreted tongues ever again, don't put on three. You put down zero. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> so don't overthink right. it. Don't overthink it. Just answer the questions that I send you honestly. And then and then what you do is you'll put them down on a graph at the end. You'll see at the very end, you print out that last page. You can print mm -hmm. out the last page and then uh, the last two pages, actually. Print those out. You don't have to print out all the questions. You can just do them on your computer. But be honest. And you have to, this is, a, I mean, it's, it's a test. These are all work well, by the way. Just so for some of you saying, well, how can I find my spiritual gift by taking a test? Believe it or not, mm -hmm. they've done a great job. These have all been uh, done through clinical, clinical, um, and and you know, kind of like not clinical trials, but thousands of people have had to answer these questions. And the way they're designed, they they pretty much are pretty accurate. Okay. One thing that I needed to think about when I wasn't sure if I did it lots or never, it's the in between ones I had to really consider. I had to really think whether I did it often or seldom. Because if mm -hmm. I did it three times in my life, that was not very often. So I really had to think right. about that. And I would even call that sometimes. I would call that seldom. If you if, mm -hmm. if God used you to interpret tongues three times in your life, that's seldom. That's not often. So don't mm -hmm. overthink it, but just take it easy. And there are no right or wrong answers. Just because you answered zero to one question does not mean that it's a wrong answer okay so be honest realize that these are like i give away more than 10 percent of my income if you don't give away more than don't sit there and try to add it up and look at it and think like you would know if you're giving 10 percent. it's like well yeah every day you know it's like yeah often i'm always <laughs> giving my money away then you put three on there okay so you put three on there you don't put zero or you don't put two sometimes but if you do sometimes then put two on there if you occasionally Put it on there. If you do it seldom, that occasion and seldom would be synonymous. Then you write one on there. Okay, but if you never give more than 10% and you've always only given four or five and that's it, write zero on there because you don't give away 10%. Well, I'm tidy, or I'm, I'm giving away God, you know. Don't, it's it's nothing again, it's not good or bad. Just be honest with yourself. Don't overthink it. I had to, you know, tell them to stop overthinking. Oh, it. you know, and stuff like this. She's a scientist. Well, that doesn't make sense. Mm, okay. <laughs> so, so when you go through these questions, 125 of them, there's a, little key, there's a little answer key that you will see. Don't worry. You can take your time. You don't have to do it in one day. Okay, you guys see this? I'm going to pull this up. Okay, you'll have an answer key like that. And it will show you that you fill in on this answer key. You fill in the numbers that you got in the questionnaire all the way down here. And then you're going to go across and you'll add them up. And then over here, you'll add them up. And then here are the gifts that will tell you. Here's a, a A through Y. 
bad administration, apostleship, celibacy. Thank goodness me and me and Linda were zero on celibacy. Okay. If you're married and you're called to be celibate, there's something yes. going on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Discernment, evangelism, exhortation, faith, giving, healing, helps, hospitality, intercession. Some people have a tremendous gift to go into prayer for everybody. I mean, it's absolutely amazing that everything they hear, not just in prayer, but we're talking laboring in prayer and just walking and pacing back and forth and, and yelling at demons and, you know, all kinds of things. Some people have a great gift of interpretation or intercession, interpretation of tongues, word of knowledge, leadership, martyrdom. Now, listen, there's questions that are going to say, I empathize with those who are struggling um, and, and are going to die or something at the, at the hands of a uh, hands of some, uh, the devil or something like that if you if that is you all the time then write down three but if you don't if, even though you would stand up for your faith and you would i would die yeah i would die if some if somebody was like that still doesn't mean you empathize with those who are dying so you answer it well seldom i or zero i don't want to die <laughs> i don't want to die for my faith so be honest, <laughs> sorry it made me laugh all right so you have mercy, then you have miracle working, missionary, pastor, word of prophecy, service, teaching, gift of tongues, and word of wisdom. When you get done with this, you will see three levels. And I mean, the maximum score you can get of any one is 15. If you get 15 all the way down on this, when you calculate it, we need deliverance, okay? Uh, we need deliverance because you're, you're a narcissist and you think that, that you're right next to Jesus. Okay, so if that happens where you get a 15 on everything coming down, okay, we'll have to retest. Okay, and the best way to retest on that is have the person who loves you the most sit down with you and do the test with you because they'll tell you. Like, oh, I get reaction. You have to do deliverance to next time. week. You know, could you imagine? I get interpretation of tongues all the time. You don't even speak in tongues. What? <laughs> You know, so, you know, so it's like, you know, oh, I, I'm generous. What are you talking about? You're tighter than a drum on a on a brand new drum set, you know, type of thing. So whatever it is, if, if you will not get 15 is the highest score. But you take the, the highest scores, that'll be your your primary gift in your life. Uh, number two, the second closest gift. Now you're going to have two or three that we're going to overlap. Uh, those of you that just came in. Uh, Linda's number uh, number one. Now listen to what we say. This now some of them were listening earlier, but we weren't recording at the time. Linda's gifts, uh, number her top gifts. There's three of them that all match at the same level: is faith, mercy, and teaching. And if you get to know Linda, you will see that she's a woman of tremendous faith. She has mercy in her life that she extends to people. Um, she just does it naturally, and she's got a teaching spirit or a teaching gift. Yeah, because she loves teaching young young children, she loves to exhort and, and teach on particular passages at Bible studies and Bible studies, and she's not shy about bringing forth some of the words that God is giving her. Her second one is helps, the gift of helps. Okay, and then the third one is giving in hospitality. That's very much Linda. Uh, that's her. So these are to be pretty accurate. Okay, now if you argue with it, say, okay, yeah, well, whatever, or you're like, okay, Lord, what I thought I have drops down in the fourth or fifth place so <laughs> help me develop these gifts in my life okay so i want you guys to do that i will email it to you guys um so send me um and uh your emails right now just show it on the screen um down here at the bottom or send me like a little chat a little a little message and if you guys send it to me i will copy and paste everybody's email just send it to me to everyone uh no i will email it to them then you guys will have my Okay, so I just want you guys to put your emails there and I'll highlight them and then I'll send everybody the gift assessment after we get off. Okay, so keep it on there while we're doing this and then yeah and then I'm gonna um, I'm gonna highlight them. Okay. And, mm -hmm. um, and you might want to write them down. Actually. Oh, we're good. Just write them all down. Okay, so keep doing that as we're coming in here. Um, yeah. Okay, and when we get your emails. Um, and you don't have to write their names for that. You know, you know which one. Okay, so we're going to do that. And I don't know how many we have on tonight. How many? Oh, 10 of us. So we shouldn't take too long doing this. Um, okay, so we have emails here. I already have some of your guys' emails. I have Jarrett's. Uh, I'm not sure if I have uh, Rebecca's, but I'm glad you guys are all putting it down there. Um, 
Uh, Marguerite, thank you. I have yours, I think, as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll do that. So uh, Linda's doing that. So while she's doing that, just let me tell you what my gifts are, okay? So those are Linda's that you heard. My, now, for me, I did have a lot of them that were tied. So yeah, I'm, I'm not saying I'm narcissistic. But when you're in ministry for a long time, and you're used of God in many different ways. Um, it's interesting how many times you will you will uh, um, go down the table. Well. There you go. There you go. Okay, so mine are number one is faith, leadership, pastoring, and teaching. Okay, I'm hoping you guys can see that in my life. I'm hoping that you can see that. If you're not seeing those gifts in my life, I got to start working on developing those gifts. The faith, the leadership, pastoring, and teaching. The second one is discernment, hospitality, and a word of knowledge. And I'll tell you that I move in discernment in so in a lot of different ways. I mean, it's absolutely shocking to me um, how it seems so natural to me in my life. I can really take, get a good sense of what's going on in somebody's life and get a good sense of what's going on in their marriage and get a good sense of what if somebody is walking in a very critical spirit or something like that. It just comes to you naturally. So some of these gifts that operate through you will come very, very naturally. It's just that you're open to that type of thing. Okay. And then uh, number three for me would be administration, miracle working. Amen. God used that more often in my life. And having a missionary heart, somebody who loves to go and minister uh, to people in foreign, foreign areas and lands. But I think missionary comes up because I enjoy being asked to come and do a teaching at, a, at another church. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I was gone for the weekend, and I was yeah. looking at teaching. So, uh, so anyhow, those are my gifts, and I hope you guys see those functions in my life and work real quickly. Okay, so as she's writing this down, so let me get this back to me, and you can trade. As she's writing down some of the, the gifts and all that kind of stuff up there, I mean, your guys' emails, let me talk about a couple of them, a couple of them that can be uh, harder to understand, because some of them are just just normal okay so service is serve teaching is teach exhortation again is to give warning or advice to okay uh to nudge to press to encourage to dissuade think about that for a minute or to incite okay so this exhortation is is clearly giving like like almost like a person that's standing on the edge of a cliff and it's raining and it's storming and they're standing there with flags and a stop sign and they're trying to get somebody to stop as they're coming in their car, okay? It's kind of that kind of used in that way. Now, sometimes that comes out in a very strong, encouraging way. So that's something we have to understand. So when it comes out like that, it's really, really important to, um, to understand that because it's not always a positive thing that can come out, but it's always positive if, it, if it's heated. For instance, uh, John the Baptist was encouraging his generation to repent. Okay, the message, the way it was coming out, wasn't a good message to hear by some of those people. But the result of that message was that they repented, they were set free of their sin, and brought forth into the kingdom of God. That's a positive outcome. Do you guys see what I mean by that? Okay, mm -hmm. uh, let's jump down to leading, or mercy. Mercy is, uh, we read through that a little bit for Linda last night. And mercy is extending, um, extending like it's like instead of sending someone to the gallows, you'd rather see them just be in prison for the rest of their life. Because you have a heart for them not to care. You have a desire not to see that happen in their life. So you extend mercy. Okay. Um, you extend mercy to that aspect. So it's just, it's if somebody's, somebody's, uh, um, uh, and it's not, giving permission but it's just understanding that you're extending mercy like a nurse or somebody you help somebody through a time that's crisis in their lives okay all right so uh let's see any questions on that one okay. any questions on any of these other ones let's talk about discerning the spirits okay so discerning the spirits this is you have to break this down first of all by the by the word itself so you got all these things I think so. okay. Discerning of spirits. What is that? Okay, discerning of spirits. Okay, so um, discerning of spirits is like this. So first of all, let's break it down into the word discernment. Discernment is moral influence. It's understanding the difference. To it means to judge well. Okay, so to discern something means you judge well. 
You have a good idea of what is evil and what is righteous. And you can discern between good and bad. So discernment is something that gives you, you kind of, you're a good judge of, of character. You've heard that term, judge of character. That means that you have this gift of discernment. Um, all right, so I'm going to unmute you guys, or I'm going to mute you all again now. Just want to mute, mute ourselves if we can. Um, uh, and the reason I'm saying that is just so that we don't, uh, I wanted you guys to unmute yourself because I wanted to hear what you guys had to say about uh, like your three or two, one, zero, but we didn't get it. No, we didn't do that. But, okay, so is everybody muted? Okay. All right. So discern, it means the moral influence. It means to judge well. It means to recognize the moral and practical consequences of your actions. Now that's important. Discernment just doesn't decide between good and evil. The discernment itself will lead you to understanding the consequences of your actions. I know if I slap this person, the consequence is they're going to slap me back. <laughs> Therefore, I choose not to slap them because they're going to slap me back. Now, that's joking about discernment, but it should be that simple to you. So if you have a gift of discernment, it should be that clear to you of how to understand the moral righteousness and, and moral evil and to make a decision and say, like, for instance, there's a lot of people, believe it or not, and it saddens my heart, there's a lot of people in our country, not in our country, but in the, in the church, that's what I meant by, in the church, which be inclusive of our congregation, that they don't see nothing morally wrong with sleeping with each other until they get, before they get married. They don't discern that. It's like, to them, it's not an issue. But what's wrong with it? We love each other. We're connected to one another. We're going to get married anyhow. And it's easy for them to not discern that this is really a negative thing here because they're getting soul tied. But what if they don't get married? What if it never gets to that point? What if it gets to the point where they're not going to get married? Right? Now, we're not talking about unbelievers here. We're talking about believers. Okay? So I want there, there's a distinction there. Or if somebody are non believers and they're living together and they, they're they have children or they're doing whatever and they get saved, it's a whole different story. But you still have to recognize what's going on there. And then there has to be a, an opportunity of repentance to take place and then wholeness and healing. And then discovering whether or not they need to still be together or not and that kind of situation. So you have situations like that. But but when I'm, I'm just using that as an example. But discernment is, should be so clear in your life that you don't struggle between good and evil. You know clearly evil from good and you know clearly the dis the consequences of your actions that's true discernment okay so now when it says discerning of spirits how can you connect that to it anybody want to respond to that knowing the difference clearly between good spirits and evil spirits yeah and and the consequences of seeing that evil spirit Okay, that is at action or in work or at work in someone's life or in a, in a situation. Okay, for instance, um, um, it's knowing how to get to the, the heart of an issue at times too. Um, uh, for instance, uh, I'm just trying to think of a time that I can remember, but I can give an example. If, if um, you see two people arguing and they're arguing over finances, okay. And let's say they're arguing over finances for the husband and wife, but you discern that that's not the issue. It's not finances the issue, okay? And it's not communication that is an issue. You're recognizing that this is a this is a a, a learned or a, a habitual behavior from from a reaction. For instance, uh, when my grandma died, and we went to her closet to clean out her closet. She had box after box after box after box after box after box after box of carnation powdered milk. Okay. She wasn't, and you know, now there's people who save up for a, a rainy day, and there's, I think it's important to have food that you can help feed other people and do that kind of stuff. But she had bought tons and tons and tons of boxes of carnation milk, a white carnation milk. Well, it was a learned behavior because she lived through the Great Depression, right? And she, and so she had that. But some of the milk was, it was like, it was so old, you pick up the box and the box would almost fall apart. 
Okay, it's a it's a learned behavior of doing something. So sometimes when somebody's struggling over finances, if you have a, the gift of discerning the spirits, you realize wait, this has nothing to do with communication or finances. This has to do with uh, stinginess. This has to do with somebody who's overly generous. Okay, now there's nothing wrong with be overly generous, but if if you only have ten dollars to your name and writing a check to the congregation for a hundred dollars, and you know it's going to bounce like a rubber ball, you don't write out a check to the to the congregation for a hundred dollars because you only have ten dollars to your name, right? Their heart's in the right place, but they can't, they don't see the consequences of their action. I had a lady that actually uh gave us a thousand dollar check in Hawaii when I was pastoring in Hawaii, and I was like, I called up one of the uh the board members and said, Oh my goodness, we just got a hundred a thousand dollar offering. Um, wow, wow, who was it? And I'm like, Well, I don't know. And then I look, I read the name, and they go, Oh, don't cash it, don't cash it, don't cash it. And or I told the secretary, and she goes, don't catch it. I go, why? What's wrong with it? She goes, it'll bounce like a rubber ball. And this person's actually been in jail because they go from church to church to church, and they're writing out checks. Uh, and the cops knew that she was she was uh, mentally ill a little bit, but she would write out a thousand. And in her heart, she wanted to just bless everybody. In her heart, she just wanted to give that she was, she actually served time in jail because she was writing checks that were bouncing. That's not. Very good at discerning right and wrong of what's going on here. So when you have a gift of discerning of spirits, you're going to know the evil and the good of what's going on, and you're going to see the actual. You can actually get down to the nitty gritty of why the cauliflower or the or the broccoli, you know, the, it, they sprout and they get like this, but you'll see the very base of it. And so the the gift of discerning of spirits is really important for anybody who has that. Various kinds of tongues. Okay, I'm not going to ask you if you speak in tongues. I do. I know Linda does. Some of you guys do, and that's fine. But that's also just the other thing, too. This word tongue it just means languages. I mean, some people actually have a gift to speak many, 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 many different languages. And there's heavenly languages, there's spiritual languages. Um, I, when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, I received the language instantly, instantly. I mean, it came to me instantly. But I think it's important to use it properly, and I think some people misuse that. Okay. But then there's a, a, all various kinds of, of interpretation of tongues. Um, I've been used one time, I think, one time to interpret a message I heard in tongues. Um, and I didn't hear it very clearly. Again, I got pictures of what that person was saying, and then all of a sudden I heard it. Like, oh wow, this is this is what this is what the Lord is saying. And I looked at over at somebody, this was in Alaska, I looked over at somebody who had the gift of interpretation, and I looked at them and they were shaking their heads saying, Yeah, this person truly has a gift of, of tongues for us today. Because when tongues are used properly and there's an interpretation to that tongue it becomes a prophetic word that's why tongues are powerful even though it's one of the least of the gifts it becomes a prophetic powerful word in the community because the interpretation follows up and that interpretation re requires response from god and when that person got up to to uh, give the interpretation of tongues it was perfectly right on with what i was i mean i mean it was exact what i was um, so anyhow, so there's people who walk in those things. So uh, any questions before we close off? Because I'm going to send you guys the gift assessment test, and I know you guys are going to be up doing it. <laughs> when you get done doing it, at the very last page, it has uh, it has this little thing right here where it says my spiritual gifts on it, and then you write it in, and then at the very bottom it has your name and stuff like that. If you guys wouldn't mind filling this out, filling that out for me. Okay, and just putting your name, your number on there like that. And you could take a snapshot and email it to me or a snapshot and text it to me. I'd like to see your gifts in your life. And I want to help you and encourage you to walk out those gifts. And I want to give opportunities as we keep growing, as we continue to grow as a mishpacha, as a family of God. I want to be able to really come to you and say, hey, we need these gifts um, to start operating our congregation. Would you be willing to start walking in the gifts that God has given you? See, sometimes we think we have to be perfect or we have to have everything in all of our ducks in, in a row to walk out according to God's ways in our life. But sometimes it's just simply understanding that it's God who gives you the gifts and you're just an empty vessel that wants to be used with God. And Lord, use me. He really, here I am. He named me. Here I am. Send me. Use me. And, you know, He named me actually is better translated. You've heard that word, He named me. Here I am. Okay? That word is better translated. At your service. Think about that thing. At your service, Lord. Here I am, and at your service. If we get that kind of mentality and that attitude, 
and watching it. And now what we're going to do in the next few weeks is going to break these down a little bit more, talk in depth of these, talk about our giftings, how they operate in a community of attached people, amen, <laughs> of people who really attach ourselves to each other and how they can be used in a negative way, in a positive way, and always being humble people and, and, and wanting to learn how to walk in humility with the gift that God has given us. So let's open up for questions. Anybody have a question? Um, raise their hand on the thing so I can see it. Um, let's see, I got to get it to where it's like here. There we go, where I can see everybody. Uh, if you have a question, no question is dumb and no question is all questions like this. Anybody? Okay, Rebecca. Hi. Um, there you go. I don't know. I don't really like when you say like about the gifts. Like I've experienced certain gifts, but like I experienced them at different times, not at like somebody's request. And so it's kind of weird. And like sometimes people don't even know. And like I'm not one of those people that like to um like go in front of a congregation and <laughs> prophesize or something like that. Like I'm scared of a lot of things. Okay. So it's kind of okay. like I don't know, like, if I would be answering those things, right? Like, I'm gonna give you a, a um, hmm. I don't have a fence, it's not mine. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, well, let me respond to that. Okay. All of our gifts doesn't mean that they have to be in front of people. And most of the time when we're walking according to the gifts that God has given us, it's outside of the congregation where it matters. And that's what's important. Like, if you get a you, you have a word of knowledge. You don't have to go up in front of people and give that. That word of knowledge could just be for one particular person. That word of wisdom could be for one particular person. Um, Linda shared a word of, of um, uh, wisdom the other day. Um, share it with us at the leadership meeting. So at our leadership meeting, we're talking, yeah. we're doing things. And, and so... Um, somebody brought up... Hold on, let me set the okay. somebody said uh, Somebody brought up the fact that this particular person's mother is a witch. And so we got to be careful of that because this particular mother is actually cursing us and, and saying things, okay, our, our congregation. So this came up in our leadership conversation, congregation, or our, our meeting. So listen to what I'm saying. This person's mother, and I'm not going to tell you who the person is, this person's mother is an actual witch that people go to and pay money and stuff to hear. Okay, so that's it. And so I know that a lot of people are um, intimidated by witches, by Satan, and I know that he's under our feet, and scripture says, and this was the word of wisdom that came from Proverbs that I know and I've stood on a lot of years, a curse doesn't alight on a righteous person, but returns like a bird to the person who sent it, so it's like it, it goes out and doesn't settle on the righteous person that bounces off and goes back to the person who sent it. So we have no need to be afraid of any curses that would try and come against us. Yeah. So the first the first idea that you hear from that is, oh my gosh, this person's a witch and they're, they're putting curses on their voodoo dolls and they're stabbing the voodoo dolls and they're doing all this kind of stuff. Whatever they're doing, it's easy for us to panic and say, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my gosh, what do we do, what do we do, what do we do? And Linda comes out and just says, a curse thrown on us can be, or returns back to the person that we get because they will not infect the righteous person. That did exactly what she said. She did it. She said it better than I did. That was like, oh, that was like a beautiful thing that we hear um, that a couple of people in our leadership team was like, oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> thank you, Lord. Yeah, I may go back and hit him hard. <laughs> may a curse come back and wham. Okay, so. So it's one of those type of things like that where we have to understand is that um, a word of not, a word of wisdom will come in and it'll bring it'll bring like reality and truth right away into someone's situation. Someone's been praying and praying and praying and praying and you speak in their life. So Rebecca, it doesn't have to be in front of the congregation. Many of the gifts we have service, help, um, people who serve and labor, 
um, all those people who are working, the girls that are just getting up and running the, the camera work and the people in the audio visual, the people setting up, uh, Alicia and everybody helping and setting up for ONED. They don't have to come forward to do that, but I'll tell you, our services would not be, would not have a good conclusion if those people weren't part of the conversation and part of the service. Their, their gifts are as important as mine. And the people, the front lines, the people like uh, Sandra and uh, I mean, uh, Samara and Sheila and everybody else, when, when people come in to those front doors and they greet somebody for the first, or they run into somebody who's a greeter at the very beginning, that sets the stage for the presence of God for the rest of the service. And if they are just, oh, well, I'm sick and tired of these people coming in all the time. You guys need to just leave us alone. You know, you guys just need to, you know, could you imagine if they came in? It's like, we don't want anybody here today. We just were sick and tired of it. And they're all a bunch of stinking rotten people anyhow. You think they're going to come back? Nobody's going to come back, right? So, you know, when you come in, hopefully Sheila and Sonny are smiling big and they're handing you a thing and they're saying hi and they're getting hugs from people as you come in because they're, we're excited to see you. That is a gift of hospitality. That is a gift of helps. That is a gift of service. Those are more important than me getting up there and preaching a sermon. Those are so important, guys. So don't ever think that your gift is diminished because because you're not getting in front of people so uh so rebecca it's not about getting in front of people and using those gifts it's being sensitive to the holy spirit and allowing god to use you but i will tell you this even though we're all empty vessels and we want god to give us gifts in a lot of different areas and we pray for god to use the gifts that take place at certain times like i said earlier if somebody needs a, uh, the gift of healing to operate in their lives and you're praying for them to receive healing from cancer they don't need a gift of yeah, a discerning of spirits. Well, unless it's a spiritual thing that's causing you upset. Mm -hmm. But they don't need, uh, you know, like, uh, I don't know, what's a simple gift that I can bring? An apostle. An apostle. They don't need an apostle or, well, I'm a great teacher. You know, I, the, the gift of teaching. So I'm going to teach you, you know, you wouldn't be in this hospital bed um, if you had ate the right food. And, you know, and some people actually do that. And you're like, you're just sitting there sick and you just want to reach up to them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you want to do that, but you don't do that. Um, so what they need is healing. So you ask God, Lord, it's by your grace, your will, your, 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 um, your, uh, what do you call it, what we saw earlier? It's, it's, you're the one that chooses what go, what we get by the measure of faith that we have. By your mercy, will you please allow me to walk in a gift of healing as I pray for my sister or my brother? And you lay hands on them and you say, be healed. Don't be afraid of doing that. Don't be, don't just pray. I've never shared with you guys the lady that the quadriplegic that I prayed for, have I? I don't think I ever have. Did anybody hear the story of the quadriplegic? True story, 100 percent true. I'm not making it up. Okay. And I'm, I'm home from Bible College in Portland, Oregon, and I'm parking. Uh, I'm I'm being a valet parker at a particular parking lot. I don't think you've ever heard this story. Um and I would park everybody, and everybody would show up in the morning. I'd park them bumper to bumper, da, 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 and I knew, and I got to the point where I knew when people were going to lunch and people wanted their cars and when they got off work. So I did all this kind of stuff and was really, really good at doing it. But I also saved spots for people who had to go visit uh, doctors and such. So this lady shows up after I had already parked everybody and I had a spot left, or a couple of spots left. And this lady, this lady probably in her 30s, late 20s or 30s, with her mother who was driving the car. And the, the grandma's uh, or the lady's daughter in the back seat. So three generations of, of, of the mother or the, or the grand, she's a grandmother. And then the lady that was in her thirties was the quadriplegic and the, the little girl that was in the back seat. Okay. Um, uh, they showed up and she needed help out of the car. And as I was helping her out of the car and putting her in a wheelchair and all this kind of stuff, and they're getting ready to go, to the uh, uh, um, the doctor's office across the street where she was being just having checkup. Yeah, I could tell that this was a very recent um, accident because she still had um, her body was still well uh, well rounded. Like she just wasn't a quadriplegic and and totally lost muscle tone and stuff. She was I could tell it was a recent thing, but she was she was uh, paralyzed from the neck down. Um, and so I helped her out and get her out, and she couldn't move at all. It was you could tell the grandmother her mother looked like she was just tired and worn out and just was just beat up and tired and the young girl was 
you know, like probably about 12 or so, and just really trying to help her do everything like that. So I help her get in the seat. As I load her in the, in the, in the seat and they went across the, to the doctor's office. And because the, the lot was already filled and I put out the field, I was in my little booth and I had so much compassion for this woman. I had not experienced that compassion ever in my life up to that point. I had so much compassion, but I was praying in the spirit for her, praying for God to bring healing to her and praying for her mother and praying for her daughter because this woman, she was a beautiful woman. She was, you know, like I said, from the neck down, couldn't move at all. And, and I was just praying and praying and praying and praying. And I was probably about three years old in the Lord. And I'm praying and just praying. I didn't know how to pray. So I just prayed in the spirit, asked, you know, and just did what I could do. And also the Lord, the Holy Spirit was putting on my heart to pray for her when she comes out, to lay hands on her. And, and here's, here's the mighty Adrian, Adrian Bernal, you know, 21 years old or whatever like that, uh, something like that. And I'm, I'm the mighty man of God. And I'm sitting there thinking, and all of a sudden I read, I, I see Acts, and it says, in the name of, of, you know, in the name of, you know, rise up in Yeshua's name. You know, what I have, silver and gold, I do not have, but I, I give to you, you know, in the name of the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm sitting there going back and forth, and I'm praying, and I'm conjuring, you know, thinking about all this stuff going up into my, my head, and I'm all excited to just serve God in this and to see him do this. And then um, and then in the process of doing this, they come out, and when they when they came out, I'm getting ready. I'm helping this lady into the car. I mean, here I built up this big old faith of like, I'm going to lay hands on this lady. She's going to rise up, you know, and I'm doing all this kind of stuff. And it's coming up, it's coming up. And uh, oops, am I, am I muted? Oh, I'm not muted. Um, so in that process, oops, I forgot to change my name. So I'm sitting there praying for her. And, and as I'm, or not praying for her at all, I'm just putting her back in the car. And, and they're getting in the car. The mother looks worn out again. The daughter, I see the, the little girl. And then I was standing on the driver's side, pacing back and forth because they're getting ready to leave the parking lot. But I'm in front of them, pacing back and forth, and they can't go anywhere, you know. And and finally, the the, the grandma rolls down the window and she says, "Are you okay?" And I said, "You know what?" I said, "No, I'm not." And I said, "I can't allow you guys to leave my parking lot until I pray for you." And I, and I leaned down like this and I looked at the girl over there. I said, "I can't allow you guys to leave until I pray for you." And I said, "Can I pray for you?" And she shook her head and mom just kind of like the grandmother was like she just put her head down the, the daughter was like her eyes like really and so i walk around in the car i open up the door and inside of me i want to say in the name of yeshua rise up and walk and grab her hand and pull her out of that car and the biggest greatest thing that come out of me is oh lord you this one you know I'm, I'm shaking i'm nervous i'm all nervous i'm putting my hands on her and i have my eyes closed and i'm saying the wimpiest prayer that I can pray. I mean, the wimpiest prayer that anybody could ever say, you know, dear Lord, if you want to use me, you're in there, and you're I'm doing it. And all of a sudden inside me, the Lord was just saying, you speak to her and you tell her to, to, to rise, to stand up. And I'm sitting there. And then I looked at her. And this is what I was saying, Rebecca, don't be afraid to speak it forth. I looked at her and said, I said, I said, you need to be healed. I said, rise up in the name of Yeshua or Jesus. I said, be healed in the name of Jesus. As I had my hands on her leg, she's sitting there like this. I'm praying for her. Her hands started moving, just like this. And her little daughter in the back seat is holding onto the seat, and she sees, and she's looking over, and she starts, she starts getting this huge joy. Her arms start moving, and I'm going, oh my gosh! And then I see the grandmother tears start flowing out, and the lady that was praying for, she just started flowing, and she started moving. Her foot starts moving, and I was expecting to just grab her and pull her out. Guess what I did? I was so freaked out. I shut the door and said, goodbye. <laughs> I said, goodbye. And, they like, and then they drive off or something like that. And, and they were just sitting there. But you could see that she was moving. Her arms started moving. Everything started moving. She had not moved. She was totally paralyzed. And here she's moved. There's no doubt in my mind. There's no doubt to me today that I'm going to meet this woman. And I'm going to see that she's going to. You know, eventually, like, I'm going to see her in heaven, and, and she's going to have to enjoy the life of walking. But I was so freaked out. I was so freaked I, I closed the door. <laughs> okay, so sometimes the operation of our gifts don't come out the way we think they are. Okay, I, I was expecting to be this, you know, Peter or Paul, you know, Peter and John, and, you know, I silver and gold I do not have, but in the name of you, sure, rise up and walk, woman. You know, is that the kind of thing like that? But all that could come out of me was the wimpiest prayer that I could pray. But then when I said, you know what, be healed in the name of Jesus. And I laid my hand on that person and I touched her. 
as soon as I touched her leg, she was right there. I was on the side, outside on the car, on my knees, praying. I touched her and she started moving. And the tears that started coming down her eyes, the tears that started coming down her mom's eyes, that were the eyes that were driving, and the little girl um, was something that I'll, I'll take away with me. And I, I don't think I've ever said that for you. Okay? Don't be afraid to be used of God and don't worry about how you do it. Okay? If God's put it on your heart and gave you a burden to pray for somebody, pray for them. You don't have to be brave. You don't have to be strong. You don't have to have your theology lined up. You don't have to have any of that. Just do what God's asking you to do and say, you name me. Here I am. I'm at your service, God. Let me be used at your service. Okay, good question, Rebecca. I'm sorry I had to throw that in there. But anybody else have a question? Just raise your hand. And then after I get off, I will email you guys that. Gift assessment test. I encourage you to do it. Um, you'll do. You'll you'll have fun doing it. But have fun with it. Don't take it so serious. Okay. It doesn't look like any more questions. Oh, Linda has something. Go ahead. Yeah, I like how you use God used you at your work, and so that's one thing that you need to think about. How does God use you in your day to day life? Yeah, He will use you, and if you're open to God using you, and you don't realize that this is about you but it's about others for the benefit of others for the benefit of all um and you realize wait you know i mean it's it's different you're not going in here to be michael jordan you know you're not part of the body the kingdom of god to become jesus you're part of the kingdom of god in his family that we simply do what jesus tells us to do and we look like him and we do what we can okay so just just so hopefully that helps you guys Again, I'm going to give an opportunity. Anybody got a question at all one night? Okay. If we don't, we'll close in prayer. And then I will email you guys the gift assessment test. And it will be two things. You'll have a front cover. You can print it out. I did print it out in booklet form. Um, but you can do that. But yes, uh, uh, um, Rebecca. Here's the last question. I'm sorry. Um, okay. Now, I might. I have to use the restroom again. But go ahead and ask the question. <laughs> Uh, I you can and I'll answer. It's a quick, it's a quick question. Um, if you can heal All yourself, right, yeah. if you can I, heal yourself with prayer, right? And do you think people could just heal people with prayer without having to touch them or see them? That's a like I've healed myself before plenty of times and I didn't take any medicine. I just said in the name of Jesus, like I had something wrong with my foot and I think I had a broken toe and I injured it many times. And then one day I just got tired because no matter what, it kept hurting me um, after it healed because it didn't heal correctly. And I prayed over it and it doesn't hurt me anymore. Um, every once in a blue moon, maybe like a year, it feels like it wants to and I'll say, Lord, you said that if you healed me, you healed me. And then whew, it's gone. But it's not the only thing. There's other things like, um, and so I'm just wondering, is that also like considered, like even if you pray for someone from far and they and they just say, oh, this and that and whatever, but they don't know that you were praying for them. And um, I don't know, is that also considered like a healing um, gift or oh. that's just like, uh, well, give, uh, prayer. Thursday night prayer is a lot of praying for healing. And I've heard stories too of people praying for folks in hospitals. Um, outside of the hospital, they just pray a blanket prayer over people in hospitals and people recover quicker. And when yeah. they're being prayed for, they can see the results of it. So, yeah, it's our faith that Yeshua meets. Yeah, we can add our faith together. It's more powerful. When he meets us, whenever he healed, it was according to their faith yeah. that he healed. And I would say right. that 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 gift that of healing yourself isn't so much a gift of healing as much as it is, it is a gift of faith. Okay. You just simply Cause... take God's word for it, for what it says. By mm -hmm. His stripes we are healed. There's nothing wrong. I mean, actually, we do that with ourselves too. If we know that we're walking in a a spirit of of a, a right. spirit of anger or a spirit of infirmity, we can ask God to remove that. We can rebuke that spirit of infirmity. And and, and Lord, I pray right now in the name of Yeshua, spirit of infirmity be gone in my life. Be out in the name of 
we can take authority over the principalities and powers of the terror mm -hmm. over ourselves as well as other people. But uh, when you pray for somebody to get healed from a distance or from afar, and especially for yourself, I, I think that's more of a gift of faith than a gift of healing. A gift of healing tends to be laying. I mean, some. I mean, there's been times where I've seen people mm -hmm. get healed and I can not pray for them. I just believe that God was going to heal them and I touched them. And by touching them, he got healed before I could even pray. Okay. I've seen that happen many times. So a gift of healing can operate without you saying one word because you're move, being moved in the authority of Yeshua. When you right. when you lay hands on the sick and it says they shall recover, right? It's a lot of times it's just by putting oil on their head and taking the elders. It says, and let, let them offer up a prayer or let them lay hands on them, the sick shall recover. Um, it's really that simple sometimes. And we feel like we have to make it a different way. But yeah. sometimes, I mean, just by you being obedient to lay hands on the sick, I'm telling you, there's been times where people have been healed that I have not even prayed for. Yeah, I was just wondering because I know in the Bible it says like, um, according to your belief, you are healed. Sometimes um, I've heard that in the Bible. And like my son, he couldn't talk. He wasn't my biological son, but he couldn't talk. And um, I asked him if he believed in Jesus and he shook his head yes. And I said, okay, um, do you believe that Jesus can give you your voice and can help you talk? And he said, yes. And, um, and I prayed over him. And I asked the Lord to help me to teach him because I didn't know how. And I, I just, I prayed about it. And then um, God gave him a voice and I taught him how to talk. But um, he asked me one day as he, be, he started talking, he said, why can't I talk before? And I said, I don't know, but I think your faith um, and you believed in Jesus helped when I prayed for you. It helped you to for God to give you your voice because it, um, he gave you the voice that you believe that he could heal you and, and do that for you. So um, he, he asked me again later on when he was all a little, much, all, a little older. And I just said, well, God hears prayers. And if you believe anything that you believe, um, God can do that for you. It yeah, doesn't have I to be me that prays for you. You can pray and believe and God will heal you. Yep, yep, and that's that. I mean, and it's according to their their the measure of faith. God's given us each a measure of faith, and so we're walk, we're supposed to walk in accordance to that measure. Some people have a tremendous amount. Like when you think of measure, you think of flour if you're baking bread. So if you're just making one challah bread for for Shabbat, you don't need a whole lot of flour. But if you're making five or six of them, you have to add more measures of flour to 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 produce that kind of thing. So if you have the faith to just simply pray for children and you have a, you don't have faith to pray for adults um then 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 pray for children with that measure of faith yeah be faithful to serve god with the gift that god's given you at the measure of faith that you have and and so that's kind of what it's talking about there for instance i have a tremendous amount of measure of faith to believe that women who cannot have children that god will bless them when i pray for them and that they will receive a child i have a tremendous amount of faith to believe that and I've seen it happen many times over, no less than 14, 15 times. I've prayed for women to, to, to be pregnant and they've gotten pregnant and they couldn't be pregnant. Some doctors said they couldn't have children or the husband could have children. I mean, or the wife can have children. And I prayed for them. And every one of them, except for one couple, but we're still believing for, for it. Every couple I've ever prayed for that couldn't have children have gotten, uh, have, have given birth to children. And, but part of it is you can't be afraid to do it. You just simply got to do it. Your supernatural ability that God's given you has to become natural and it has to become reality, right? Someone says, I can't have children. Would you like that children? Yes, I would love to have children. Okay, can I pray for you? Really? Yeah, let me pray that God will bless you with the child. Okay, right now in the name of Yeshua, Lord, I pray right now that you would just, whatever's going on, you repair it, whatever you need to do in the name of Yeshua, I pray that you kill this person with the power of your spirit. And I say, Lord, bring the child forth in the name of Yeshua. We don't have to say even the name, but I would encourage you to say it. But when we act out as the children of God and we do things according to his will and according to his ways, the power of God is the one who brings, who does that. So Linda, you have the image? Um, I 
was just wondering about do we need to lay hands on people and you know it's part of faith that we don't have to do it uh exactly the same every time because i looked at uh acts chapter 19 it says god was doing extraordinary miracles by paul's hands so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that touched his skin were brought to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out of them so all they had to do was take an apron that had touched Paul and just bring it to the to Hila and people would get healed. So God's power is just amazing. He doesn't use any particular um, formula. Right, right. And that's when it talks about various kinds. I mean, I don't know, a handkerchief, you know, I believe that. Uh, faith is powerful. Um, and faith can work as a placebo sometimes. That's why they still do placebo effects, but they get healed. You know, you might go down to the doctor's office and you're a part of a trial. You don't know if you're receiving a placebo or the actual medicine. And some people who take the placebo, almost, I mean, almost as many that take the placebo get healed as the people who take the medication. Because the power of faith, the power of belief is really, really powerful. Um, and so if you believe that God is the healer and God can heal you, and, and, you know, okay, Lord, thank you for, for uh, 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 Rab, Rab Shaul's uh, uh, handkerchief, um, and you get healed from that. I mean, this the woman that was bent over just touched the seat seat of Yeshua, just the seat seat of Yeshua, and she got healed, because there's healing in his wings, the, the scripture say. And, and the wings were the seat seat, and she reached out to grab the seat seat. She knew there was healing in that, and she was not going to allow anybody to take that from her. She touches the issue and she has to, who touched you? <laughs> what are you talking about? There's people bumping all over the place. I mean, it's like, what are you talking about? All this? It's like, no, no, power left me. Power came out of me. Who touched me? And that's powerful, right? That's powerful. When you think about it, this lady's faith had, she had enough faith to believe that she just could touch the edge of his garment, the corner of his garment, so that would bring down. That's powerful. Powerful. Okay, any other comments? Questions? Let me see who's got their hand raised. Nope. All right. Well, why don't we close in prayer? It's past 10 o'clock. This has been a wonderful class tonight. Um, a lot of repetition of things that I said, but it's important. That's how I like to teach. I like to say it many different ways. I use doublets and triplets, just like Yeshua, Rabbi Yeshua. So that way those who are hearing can hear it different ways and gather them and bring that in. But let's just pray. And then when I get off, I'm going to email everybody. Um, uh, this is underscore. Okay, that's an underscore. Okay, great. I'm going to email you guys and uh, and start doing the test. I know some of you are going to want to do it right now. Wow. Amen. Well, Vinu Shabbat our Father in heaven, thank you for this evening. Thank you for this opportunity to begin to talk about the, the uh, ministry gifts and really help us understand these, Lord, as we go forth. I thank you, Lord, that you have, you have breathed life into every single person on here tonight. And you've given every single person, every single person in here, a cluster of gifts. A, a, this, I think of these grapes and being on a big, huge uh, cluster of, of just all these grapes that are connected. And I thank you, Father, that you've given all these gifts according to your measure, according to your will, according to what you've designed us to do. And Lord, I thank you, and I pray, Lord, that every person on there will, will discover their gifts, um, begin to pray about those things, and begin to see you uh, manifest those gifts in their lives. I pray, Lord, that you give them courage and strength and equip them to simply, even if it's a weak prayer, like I prayed for that woman, I pray, Lord, that the power of the Holy Spirit will work through them, whether it's the gift of helps, the gift of service, or whether it's the gift of tongues, or the interpretation of tongues, whether it's prophecy, whether it's lead leadership, whether it's pastoring, whether it's speaking, whatever it is, Lord, I pray that you will help them start putting that into fruition to bring those gifts in and manifesting those gifts in a proper, loving way because love has to supersede all of them and if they don't then they're not for us and so we thank you father motivate us lead us direct us and guide us we give you glory and praise tonight by saying yeshua hamashiach we all say amen all right guys in about the next 15 minutes just expect for me to uh to check your emails and um and enjoy have fun <laughs> And again, fill out the bottom, write down your gifts and okay. take a snapshot of it and send it to me. For all of you that don't know, I'm usually up to three o'clock in the morning anyhow. 
So I will be up. So you guys, God bless you. We love you. Have a wonderful evening, okay? Thank you. Bye, everyone. God bless you all. God bless God you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye, Good night, everyone. Bye, Mariel. Bye. <laughs> We've gathered to worship here in the house of the risen sun.